Hey everybody, and welcome to this week's Design Cinema. This is Fein Zhu speaking, and uh, sorry for the delay this week because uh, I've been quite busy monitoring a bunch of stuff. We actually launched a uh, new version of our school website, so if you haven't been there, go ahead and check it out. It's www.fzdschool.com, and uh, make sure to check out Student Gallery because we added a lot of cool things in there. So anyways, I'll talk about that in a little bit later in the video. Let's first talk about this painting. So there's, these are, there's going to be two paintings that's going to be covered in this uh, episode both of which I started as a test uh, for some of the internal stuff we'll be doing here. Uh, usually what I like to do is, before I teach a subject matter, I like to do some quick tests to make sure that uh, the things I want to teach is uh, something I could do live in class and in a time allowed. So this is sort of started from that and I just decided to sort of paint it up uh, so you guys can see the process. Now both of these are demonstrating uh, a little bit more of the finishing process. Uh, the reason why I don't record this often uh, for the design cinema is because doing details, detailing is actually quite boring because all you're doing is just scribbling a lot of little things, highlights, uh, cut lines, and all these various things. And in a video presentation, it's somewhat boring. But I thought you guys uh, might want to see it anyway, so uh, that's what's going to happen in this video. You're going to see a sort of rough roughed out painting that took about uh, maybe less than about half an hour to an hour or something like that. That's beneath this painting and we'll spend another hour or so uh, painting in the detail. So here I'm adding in the little vehicle, a uh, little police vehicle. So the scene here uh, is just another kind of uh, general sci-fi sort of world, the big tall buildings, uh, you know, kind, kind of typical. Again, these are test paintings uh, where the focus is the techniques itself to show students. Um, so, and then these vehicles are sort of those police kind of things coming in to control the crowd. There's a bunch of people walking around. And what we're gonna see me use is a series of detail painting as well as the use of photo textures, which if you wanna find out how to do them, they're in the other episode, the one where the UFO guy's coming in from the sky. So in this video, I'm gonna skip the, um, the actual putting in textures and rotating because that's quite time consuming and a little bit boring as well. So now the technical aspect of this um, image is about 5,000 pixels wide, which is quite small for painting of this kind of scale. Uh, because the reason why I did that is because these are tests. Uh, I don't want these to be uh, some kind of uh, finished painting of any kind. So 5,000 is plenty for that type of testing. Okay. And the test here, actually, you guys didn't see it, which is the beginning of this painting. I actually had three of these. If you wind back, you'll see three paintings. They all started the exact same method, which I took a, a um, just a kind of procedural random values that, uh, with a brush and laid in some clouds into the sky. Those are actually photo clouds. They're real clouds. And so all three of them actually have the same clouds. If you t guys take a look at the final images, you notice the upper left corner cloud, that little white puffy ones, are the same in both images. Um, the, the point of this was to see, you know, to teach students basically, long as you have values on the page, you could turn the subject matters to whatever you want. And that's why this first image is uh, something of big cities and vehicles, while the second one's gonna be more of a, a surface of an alien planet. Uh, even though both of them started with the exact same color palette and uh, method. So, um, Anyways, let's go back to this painting here. Um, so adding details, all these buildings, uh, the basic compositional rules are have been established. Or th that's what helps with scale, in which we have something that's big, uh, medium, and small in the same painting. Okay. Value-wise, same thing. You're going from uh, uh, very focused and dark areas uh, onto something that's very, very light. Uh, so th all this kind of stuff is there to just trick your eye to think that what you're seeing in uh, on the screen here is taking place in a 3D space, even though it is a 2D painting. And the screen you're looking at this is also 2D. So we have to utilize a bunch of tricks, and that comes down to the use of fundamental skills, uh, that kind of understanding. Which I think is a good time to cover some of the questions that you guys have been asking on YouTube. So this is the best time to cover that while you guys watch me uh, just, just add details all over the place, right? Again, it's a little bit boring. That's why these videos, I don't usually make them because if you just squint your eyes and step back from the screen, almost nothing changes because the change is happening very slowly. You're just seeing a dot here, a dot there, but of course, after an hour or two, the painting will have a dramatic different effect. But as you watch it uh, being done one step at a time, the changes are not dramatic as what the um, kind of like the beginning stages of painting will have. Right. But here's quite important before I so see you can see here these are the textures being laid in. Um, I just laid those in, kind of took some scraps of random stuff, uh, junk, and just kind of threw them in there. And I just turned the layer on to show you guys and add a little bit of color splash onto the uh, vehicle that's close to you, that little orange thing. And now I'm just adding some flying vehicles to give it more scale. Okay. Anyways, let's talk about the, uh, the questions. So one of the ones we get a lot uh, 
is the uh, the question of versus uh, regarding online courses. Now, the reason why we don't do online courses, well, personally, I don't uh, like them as well, uh, and I'll explain that why, is because our school is focused primarily on fundamental skills. Um, to learn that kind of stuff is very, very tricky online. And I think the majority of online courses I've seen that's out there, a lot of them are actually uh, very specific, very topic specific. For example, it deals with uh, sketching or digital painting or how to do landscapes. Now, these things are very beneficial for other professionals or semi-pro people. Because for us, when we see another professional um, carry out certain technique, we could understand why they're doing it. We're like, oh, okay, so that's how they do textures. Oh, okay, that's how they do a highlight, right? But most of these courses, I don't think I've seen too many, uh, at least online, deals with the fundamental stuff, which is like the hardcore perspectives, the hardcore lighting, the hardcore compositional stuff. Now, these things, when the professionals are working, they don't share too much with you either. Just like these videos you're watching here, uh, even though this is a painting here, I'm not explaining anything of how this is set up. I'm not setting, I'm not explaining how the perspective was calculated, how the composition was arrived, how we determine the lighting. We skip all that because those things are the core fundamentals. So what you're essentially watching is just a professional paint something, and it's kind of fun to. Uh, watch, but to do it yourself, uh, especially if you haven't done this kind of stuff before, um, conceptual design or drawing, it's, it's very, very tricky to do. And uh, I like to use analogies for this kind of stuff. So, uh, you know, for example, most of these courses that are taking place online is the same thing as watching, uh, for example, an NBA player play basketball. Just videos of, uh, say, Kobe Bryant or Shaq O'Neal or something like that, making videos of them how to do certain trick shots or certain moves on the court. And they're pretty fun to watch. You could probably gain something about at least the uh, the knowledge of basketball or you know how how these guys pulled it off. But imagine you're someone who just sat at home for for 20 years and never even picked up a basketball or even worked on the gym. Now these kind of techniques that th these pros are showing you does nothing except to give you information. If you actually picked up a basketball and tried to do it, it's probably pretty much impossible. So what fundamental skills are, that's you know, t uh, going along with the same analogy, is your coach and your trainer and, and, the, and the person teaching you uh, both things, right? And it's exactly the same here. It breaks down to two parts. The first part is teaching you the plays, you know, how the rules of basketball, how do you move around, how do you deal with different situations, uh, all those sort of kind of uh, on the court behaviors. And then you've got the trainer who comes in to make you work out in the gym every day and run track and wake up at six in the morning and practice all day long. That's exactly the same thing that's required in our industry when it comes to fundamental skills. Uh, you have to do this stuff every single day, every single week, month and month and month on. So an online course could not cover that kind of thing because there's no way you could run a course 24 hours a day and have a coach and a trainer uh, next to you. And that's the same reason why there's no online courses for playing basketball or online courses to how to uh, be a better soldier in the military. These things require hands-on skills and it requires other professionals to be next to you to train you up. So in our in our case, we have students are in class uh, from you know nine o'clock all the way till the end of the day, six thirty, and then they're doing homework for the rest of the time. So they're spending about roughly eighteen hours a day practicing this kind of stuff, day in and day out. And every single day, the instructors are on hand to encourage them and to fix their mistakes. And also, one of the most important things about uh, a, a physical class versus online is the human interaction with your teachers as well as your classmates. Because classmates create a, a competitive uh, environment. So because, uh, you know, we have students here that actually took many online courses, uh, various things online, uh, various courses uh, in schools. And the thing is, they tell me they really didn't do homework at all because the such the pressure is not there to do it. You know what I'm saying? The online courses are mostly every week you watch a video of some professional doing some something pretty cool, but then you, as soon as the video is over, you kind of go off and do something else. Maybe you sketch for an hour or something and the sketch doesn't look anything like what the professional is doing, and then so you give up and uh, basically spend the rest of the week doing something else and then watch the video again. And then within six, ten weeks, the course is over and what you gained really isn't much. Now I'm talking about people who haven't done this at all. For professionals, it's a completely different story. Uh, generally, when I watch a demo from uh, another person in the industry, I can actually gain a lot of information from that person. But uh, but that's not the point of our school. You know, The school that I started here is all about the core fundamentals, the, the stuff that's underneath this painting. Um, so anyways, hopefully that helps you guys understand the reason why uh, such online courses don't exist. 
Now, because I know most of our audience here are not professionals, are but more student level, trying to learn this kind of thing. So really, get yourself into a class, get yourself into a school. It doesn't have to be my school, it could be any of them. Do you know what I'm saying? There's plenty of school that offer um, at least the drawing part. That, that part is important. And also, just some advice on picking schools. Definitely take a look at the um, student portfolios, because uh, most schools, we can always, you know, my school included, we always put instructor stuff up. And that stuff is always very fancy. But you have to see, can the instructor's work translate over to the students? You you know, is the school capable of producing students that has the same kind of work ethics as the instructors? And the best giveaway of that is the student uh, portfolios. And the other thing that gives away is, is that what you want to learn? Because, uh, you know, we could say whatever we want. We could say, hey, our school teaches uh, next generation 3D. You know, words are very easy to put in. But if you look through our portfolio, obviously, you know, no student is doing any of that kind of stuff. So therefore, we don't claim it. So, you know, look at a student work and see, is that what you want to do? If they're doing a bunch of concept art, they're doing you know, character, creature designs, and vehicles, whatever, then that's most likely that's what the school is teaching you. Um, so anyways, that's the that's a little bit short description and advice for you guys thinking about going into this business. Um, and also, uh, you know, once again, go take a look at our school as well. We offer the same kind of stuff. Um, and, but this thing is not easy. This this industry is very, very hard. Like I said, you're going to work day in, day out for, for month and month and month, years and years and years to practice this kind of skill. So... Anyways, let's go back to this painting for a while. Uh, we'll see you start a second painting. It's the same kind of thing where we scribbled uh, some kind of random uh, painting and then now I'm taking this into a more refined uh, finish. So you can see the cloud on the upper left corner is exactly the same cloud as the one from the previous image. You know, It's because both the, both three, there's actually three of these. I didn't have time to finish the last one. So the third one gonna, was gonna be some kind of another city kind of scene. Just trying to show students how different you can make the subject matters even though we utilize the exact same value chain. Okay, so the, the idea or design goal for this one is more of a kind of like an alien planet or something weird, kind of Earth-like world. However, the plant life is perhaps uh, almost uh, a different thing than photosynthesis plants that we see here on Earth. Yeah, They grow differently using different kind of energy. And there's like a couple of soldiers guarding and a group of dudes kind of the, towards the middle left of the screen. There's a robot in there and a kind of group, uh, group of dudes just hanging out. So... Um, Pretty basic setup uh, for a painting. Not, not too hard in terms of brain cell burning. Uh, this is again more of a value uh, tutorial for our students and also how to then take that kind of initial values and apply details. So the thing about details is just patience. You have to kind of let your mind just take that kind of thing because saying to yourself, you're gonna spend the next two, three hours just detailing. It's not that fun, actually. The most fun part of a painting for me, and I think for most professionals, is the initial first half an hour to an hour setup time. Because at that stage, your mind, at least for the creator themselves, you already know what you try to do. Everything is there. The detail is for your audience to understand. Do you know what I'm saying? So the fun factor kind of slowly goes away as you start doing details because, you know, the, the thing is actually finishing your head a long time ago. So, but it takes patience to do it. And sometimes we have students that are not that patient enough. They, they do the initial 20 or maybe in their case, maybe two hours of work. And then that's only 20% of the painting. They still need to spend another, you know, 80% finishing it. And that's the part most people stop at, you know, is the rough stage. Because the rough stage is fun. It, it looks kind of interesting. It looks, looks kind of cool. And it communicates enough details for, at least for the students themselves. But for someone looking at it, the audience, they actually don't understand exactly what they're doing. And also for the 3D modelers, it's a hard thing for them to figure out if your things are too loose, right? These kind of production paintings, they're fun to do, but you always have to get down to the hardcore detail line drawings and the explanation drawings because uh, in reality, what we do here is not artwork. You know, this is not a piece of art. It's not a painting. It is production. It is meant to become a product later. So w when it's a product, a lot of people are going to be working off of these kind of things, especially 3D modelers and lighters and texture guys. All these guys are going to rely on your information. And the clearer you can communicate that, the better they could do their jobs. So, um, so that, that phase of detailing cannot be skipped. Okay. So but you can see on these videos, it's actually quite, quite, you know, kind of doesn't really move forward as spontaneous as the other videos the, with, in which we start from uh, something raw and get it to a rough finish and then we just call that the, the finished thing because those move a lot. Every every few seconds the screen is changing whereas here the, cha the screen is only changing a few percent at a time. So uh, this one also got some texture added. I added some old wood textures you can see to the base of that and then we just dress it up in Photoshop to hide the textures. The thing you want to avoid is the blatant straight use of some kind of texture because what you get is a 
difference in density, which I've talked about many, many times. Uh, the painting itself and the texture itself will have different kind of, um, I guess, if you measure the detail per pixel, a photograph will have a lot of detail per pixel, and its density, therefore, is very high. Uh, a painting, unless you spend a lot, a lot of time on it, is not going to have the same kind of density. So when you throw a raw photograph into a very early beginnings of a painting, you'll have this mismatch of density. So, But it's very easy to fix. You just have to paint into both. Make the photo a le little bit less density, and then bring up the density on the painting. And that stuff, over time, you'll get used to where to put the balance, and where to kind of extract the density, and where to, in the photographs, do you get, get rid of the density. Yeah. And what you end up with is a nice balance where you could definitely see photo elements. However, the kind of uh, the line between painting and photo becomes gray. It's no longer, oh, that's uh, just throwing a photo there and it's pretty you know, Photoshop looking. You know, we, all of us want to avoid that kind of look. Here, working in black and white just to balance out the value. This was a little trickier painting to do because of the kind of alien environment. I wanted a kind of a foggy world. So it's not exactly uh, a forest like. Uh, place, but uh, very, very mysterious in a way, you know, maybe these things are releasing gas into the atmosphere, so, and therefore it messes with value slightly, because these plants, or whatever these things are, have their own local value, which is kind of this dark, probably a 50% gray value, but within the fog, the fog is going to diffuse that light and give you a lighter value on them, so you're kind of creating a, uh, making things look farther away, but at the same time, they start to look transparent in a way, which is not what I wanted. So you have to constantly fight that transparency problem by adding values back, but yet not so dark that they become, um, their, their local values start to change. So using a black and white layer definitely helps uh, in that step. Okay. So, and also back to the, um, the question the photo, uh, that you guys get on YouTube, another one we get a lot, which is, uh, I think I answered before, but I'll answer in more detail, just like the classroom one, which is, you know, which brush do you use and uh, what version of Photoshop? The answer to that is it doesn't matter because all it's all about the fundamentals. If you learn this kind of stuff, you could draw this entire thing in a ballpoint pen if you want. If the, if the uh, fundamentals are good, it does not matter. A good design will carry through if it's a painting or a line drawing, it, you know, nobody seems to care and neither will clients. You you know what I'm saying? I mean, clients will prefer these kind of paintings, but if you could design great stuff using a ballpoint pen on a piece of copy paper, then that's fine. So when you migrate over to Photoshop and use your own brush or whatever you want to do, and you get the same professional result, it doesn't really matter what brush you use, right? So it's the same same thing. And you, you know, let's go back to an analogy of the basketball player. You know, what brand of shoes they wear versus you know what basketball they're using and what jersey brand is it Nike, is it you know Reebok, whatever. In the, the day, it doesn't matter. It's the skill of the professional that's going to pull off the plays, not the equipment they are wearing. I'm sure the same. You know, I think you could take Kobe Bryant and give him some crazy, um, you know, no name brand shoes and no name basketball. He'll play just as well in a court somewhere in the uh, you know in in, in a park. You know. I'm saying he's still better than someone who never played basketball before. So it's not the equipment. It's always the skill of the person. So spend the time learning about that. Don't worry too much about the equipment. You don't need the same thing as what professionals have because we get that question a lot. Uh, and the reason for that, I think, um, you know, this is not just on YouTube. Ever since I've been teaching since about 2002, this kind of question comes up from students all the time, which is what do you use? What equipment do you use? What exact brand of pen do you use? Like down to such specifics, you're like, whoa, what's going on? You know, why do you want to be so specific? The reason for that is because they're looking for a secret. A lot of students are looking for like, oh, this must be done this way because of the equipment. This painting or this drawing or this design, somehow the professionals have an edge on me. What is that edge? That edge must be the equipment. It must be the brand of pen. So if I have the same brand, maybe I could achieve the same thing. But of course, I think most people realize no matter what brand or something you match to the professionals, it doesn't change a single thing. It comes down to hard hours of practice, right? So that that's a, that's one of those things that uh, is quite con uh, deceiving, I think, for people who has been in the industry because uh, it, because you know our job is so inherited internal that the only thing the audience sees are are the external stuff, the finished result, and therefore the only thing they can relate to that is the equipment. So that's why you see a lot of, uh, especially younger kids, asking for uh, for very specific things of what we use when none of the professionals will ever ask that. Do you know what I'm saying? I think in all my 
time in this business, not a single pro really asked me like, oh, you know, what exact Photoshop version are you using? What exact brush are you using? They don't care because everyone has their own method of working. They ask more about like, okay, how do you go about the design? How do you think through this? You know, you have a design problem. How do you solve it? Because those are things that are hard for professionals to, to do. And that's the things we ask each other about uh, versus the actual um, process, right? So at the end of the day, the process is not important. It is the end result and how much do you know to get to the end result. So. Hopefully that helps some of you guys. So this painting, as I'm just talking about random stuff, you guys see that it's starting to come to an end. Nothing really new in this painting, so that's why I'm not talking too much about you know how it was done. It's very straightforward. It has very little layers. So if you ever, whenever the menu shows up, you, can, you guys can see that there's only probably one or two layers uh, at most. Uh, sometimes there's no layers. I'm just painting it raw. So not much photo stuff, just a little bit of texture work. Just trying to keep this as basic, uh, basic as I can, so that way students here can also adopt. All right. So we teach things here are very stage-like. So you go from drawing, perspective, all that, into very basic black and white stuff, and then you move into colors. So at every stage, we push the students forward, but not so far as to get them lost. And that's been a very successful teaching method uh, that's been used for many, many years. So, And that's how you produce students, because you build a confidence. Confidence is very important in our business, because if you draw bad stuff day in and day out, uh, even though you're drawing, but nothing gets improved, it's not good. What you want to do is every single drawing, you learn something new, uh, especially when you, you are in a school environment and uh, that's what we try to achieve oh, another question we get is you know some of the websites we have so I already told you guys about the school which is triple uh, wfzdschool.com my personal blog is actually very simple it's just uh, fainzu design dot blogspot.com and uh, you'll find uh, the latest images uh, especially these two this, these two paintings will be up there and so you can, guys could grab the high-res versions as well so whenever there's a the, um, design cinema out that has a image in it uh, you, you, sh you should be able to find the high-res version on my um, blog so so next week I hope to do a little bit longer one. This week has been very very busy because we uh, we have also have a show in Taiwan where some of our uh, staff are at, so I can track that stuff and uh, a ton of stuff that we're doing at left and right. And we also have a graduation show coming up, by the way. Um, so you guys, if you are in the Singapore area, you guys are welcome to come by. That is, I think June 10th, uh, I believe. Uh, not exactly too sure here off my head, but go to our website you can check it out, and you can see a bunch of uh, cool stuff from our graduates. So we've been quite busy prepping. Uh, the stuff for that show as well. Um, so this, yeah, just adding highlights now, little tiny hits of light. The light source in this case is coming from the upper left, uh, the same direction the clouds are being hit at, and that was determined pretty much by the photograph that I used. All right, everything else is painted raw, except the only thing here that's a photo is the, is the cloud. Uh, and that's a very tiny bit, just the upper left corner. So. Anyways, hopefully you guys enjoyed this episode, and I apologize for a very quickie one, but hopefully this one's filled with some information, especially for uh, for those of you who are younger and thinking about going to this business. Really consider uh, you know what you want to learn because this business is hard, and uh, you know choose the right uh, courses. You know, and again, not selling my schools, many places you guys could go to. Uh, just choose the one that you think will fit you the best uh, in terms of what you want to, what business you want to get into, what industry, right? So ours is pure conceptual stuff for the entertainment business. Um, you know, not, not much else. So uh, anyways, as this comes to an end, hope you guys enjoyed it and I'll see you guys uh, next week, man. All right, bye.